All right. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. Today we have on Don Carveth. He was a professor at uh, sociology and social and political thought at York University, Glendon College in Toronto. He is a training and supervising analyst in the Canadian Institute of Psychoanalysis and a member of Division 38, or sorry, 39 of the American Psychological Association. He serves on the faculties of the Toronto Institute of Psychoanalysis, the Toronto Child Psychotherapy Program, and the Advanced Training Program in Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy of the Toronto Psychoanalytic Society. Uh, quite a mouthful there. Uh, he's past editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Psychoanalysis, Review Canadien de Psychoanalyse, and a member of the editorial boards of Psychoanalysis and Contemporary Thought, Free Association, SciArt, a hyperlink journal for the psychological, psychological study of the arts, and the Journal of Psychosocial Studies. Um, you could find in the show notes a link to Don's website and YouTube channel, as well as his latest book, Guilt, A Contemporary Introduction. So uh, how are you doing today, Don? You got anything um, you want to tell the audience about yourself before we get going? Uh, I'm well today. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's nice to meet you, Jared. Looking forward to our talk. Likewise. So... For the audience's sake, I know we just went over this, but I came across your work when I was uh, trying to research the connection between Jean-Paul Sartre and Eric Fromm, and I don't think I found much else besides your work that brought these two thinkers together. Uh, and then I came to find out, you know, you're also very uh, interested in Eric Erickson. He's somebody I've been studying a lot recently related to identity issues and how that works in the uh, American context and the current, what I think of as an identity crisis nationwide. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you recently put out a video on Marxism where you talked about uh, how you relate to Marx's uh, method of analysis and uh, where you fall along the, scale of various socialist thought more into the libertarian camp yes. and so yeah i figured i had to interview you and uh okay. here we are okay glad you did um so today uh i wanted to really focus on a couple of main topics uh that you write about extensively one is authority and authoritarianism and how that relates to the superego versus this uh, idea you develop about the conscience and how those two things are different and how they play into maybe political ideology and other more social questions. Right. So right. Uh, before we jump into that, I do want you to let everyone know about your new book, which... Uh, touches on some of these topics and uh, make mm -hmm. sure that people know where to find it. It's by Rutledge. It's called Guilt, a Contemporary Introduction. <clears throat> it's part of a series, um, and the editors wanted to uh, require everyone who writes a book in this series to keep uh, the word count down to a maximum of 40,000 words. So it's a thin book. It's maybe around 80 or 85 pages. Um, I love being limited in this way because I can be wordy. And I, in the past, have written like an academic. This forced me to uh, write much more clearly and focus and uh, get to the point. So it, it's been a good experience for me. Um, it's available everywhere now. It came out about a month ago. Have you been getting a lot of feedback on it yet? I have been getting. I've been getting requests for interviews, um, such as yours. Um, so, uh, and it will be being reviewed by various people in journals. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy. It, it looks like it's it's going to uh, fly well. Good. It's good to hear. Um, yeah. So one of the. And from the description, it looks like you talk a good deal about 
the way that the superego and the conscience are different, I think that would be a good place to start. Sure. Because uh, very relevant to the other talks as well. Right, right. Well, um, I guess as I began as a sociologist. Um, my PhD was in sociology, and I taught sociology for many years. And as a sociologist, I was always disturbed by the problem of sociological relativism. Um, on this side of the mountains, people have this set of morals and ethics. But on the other side of the mountain, people have a radically different set of ethics and morals. And how can morality be so completely relative? I mean, are there no universals? Um, but as a discipline, sociology really requires people to avoid ethnocentrism from um, assuming that their morality is the true morality. Um, I, I just found this impossible, uh, this kind of sociological relativism. Uh, <clears throat> I turned to psychoanalysis partly to uh, resist this. Um, because the psychoanalysts know that babies come into the world with all kinds of impulses and desires that do not fit well with the social surround. Socialization is a battle, you know, between society via the parents and the child. The child wants to poop when he wants to poop. He doesn't want to poop when the parents or where the parents <laughs> think he should poop. Um, and so... There's this battle between the individual and, and, and society, and sociologists seem to have no insight into this at all. They seem to assume that, that a child was like a piece of clay or putty, and it was molded any which way. Nowadays, they would use a linguistic expression, society inscribes itself. Uh. But there's, there's nothing to fight back um, in this perspective. And I knew there was plenty to fight back, because as a kid, I had done plenty of fighting back. Um, so that's partly why I turned to, to psychoanalysis. But even when I got into psychoanalysis, I found the same problem. The um, moral function, according to Freud, is handled by the superego. The superego was composed of two things. Aggression, the child's aggression turned away from the people who frustrate him. Because if you show your aggression at them, they're going to reject you or punish you. What are you going to do with your anger? Well, mostly you turn it back on yourself which is the essence of what the superego is. It is anger for others turned back on the self. So now I'm yelling and beating up on myself as opposed to attacking others. That's the first layer of the superego. The second layer is internalization of the parental superegos, internal, and they come from society. So it's the internalization of social norms, folkways, mores, and laws. Um, but people have different superegos. People in different cultures have different superegos. People in the same culture have different superegos. So how do we understand this? And are all superegos, are we into sociological relativism again? Is the superego nothing more than internalized morals? Um, if you criticize uh, a particular superego, you can only do it from the standpoint of another equally relative superego. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there seems to be no judge to judge the judge. Uh, and um, this makes it very difficult in practice. Um, um, well, so I suffered from this problem, you know, for a long time. And um, I suppose ultimately I came to the idea of conscience as a separate function. See, 1923, Freud merged conscience into the superego. Um, okay. Therefore, losing the possibility of talking about conflict between conscience and the superego. Uh, and I feel that was a great mistake. And, and so for 20 years now or more, I've been pleading with my colleagues to reverse Freud's error and move conscience out of superego and see it as, sep as a separate mental structure. So we would have id, which is the passions uh, and the biological uh, roots, 
uh, ego, rationality, superego, internalized morality, and conscience, uh, a separate function, so that we can once again begin to talk about conflict between superego and conscience. I mean, Ed Snowden's superego said you swore a loath of, of loyalty, you know, to the government. Uh, but his conscience was saying, look, I got to blow the whistle on these characters. Uh, that's a classic conflict between conscience and superego. He went with conscience. Um, so, so what is conscience? Where does it come from? Uh, right. I think, I think it's ultimately biologically rooted. Um, all of the recent primate studies, you know, for years, decades, we had this view of nature red in tooth and claw, uh, animal <laughs> aggression. Right. We blamed, we blamed human destructiveness on the beast in man. You know, whereas in fact we know it's uniquely human. Um, the beasts are far more social, uh, certainly the primates. Yeah, there's are, are far more concerned with one another. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You. I don't. Oh, you were uh, cutting in and out a little bit, but um, the yeah, there's been a lot of research on bonobos lately as well, which really have uh, interrupted that that idea about you know the primate socialization and stuff and uh still documentaries are mostly gonna look at uh chimpanzees but right no it's not universal among among the primates but uh, generally speaking there's plenty of evidence of, of pro-social uh mutuality and concern among many primates there are variations they're not all like that but mm -hmm. uh, there are enough that are like that to disturb our view of animals as aggressive, beastly. I mean, the generalization applies pretty well to humans, um, at least adult humans. We become often pretty beastly uh, for various reasons having to do with socialization. But I, I, I think we come into the... Oh, and then on top of that, there are the studies by Paul Bloom at Yale child care center where he's got three to six months old kids um, and he, he puts a little theater on the curtain opens and there's a fuzzy animal that's trying to push a billiard ball up a ladder and he's struggling struggling and he's just about to get to the top and a red rabbit comes and pushes him down he tries again mm -hmm. red rabbit pushes him down third time he's trying trying a blue rabbit comes and helps him succeed curtain closes they bring a tray out two trays with the red rabbit and the blue rabbit the kids always choose the blue helpful rabbit then yeah they complicate <laughs> they complicate by bringing with the bad rabbit they bring a cookie and then they bring two cookies with the bad rabbit good ra good rabbit has no cookies this complicates things the ch ch children are corruptible but it seems like that, that their first impulse is to go with the good guy. And what is the age range on that uh, study? The kids, I think, are, is it the, the youngest are three months or it might be six months? Yeah, it's in, so incredibly young, to, way before most people would assume there's any kind of moral sense. Uh, way in, before language, way before language. Right. Um. So this is an interesting uh, theory to me because, you know, since the 70s, you know, with this whole post-structuralist uh, turn in philosophy or French theory or whatever you want to call it, right. um, the go-to has basically been an anti-essentialist position to, to get around these kind of authoritarian views of human nature. And you're clearly going in a different direction that uh, kind of cuts against that, that trend. Yeah. And um, I think it's, uh, it's interesting that this idea of morality isn't necessarily new. I, Kropotkin was very uh, concerned with uh, demonstrating the natural sociality and mutual aid of uh, different species yeah. as well as human beings. Title of um, his book, Mutual Aid. Right. 
And uh, yeah, I think uh, it does more um, useful things to point that out than to just say that there is no nature whatsoever. Right. Well, also Chomsky, back in the 70s, I think it was, there was a recorded video, recorded interview or debate dialogue between Chomsky and Michel Foucault. Mm -hmm. And this was exactly the point. This was exactly the point. Um, Chomsky insisted we come into the world with a whole lot going on that's biologically grounded. And we're not just entirely shaped by social forces the way that uh, Foucault would have it. Oh, yeah. And then... Yeah, there there's some exceptions for sure too. Like I think even Richard Dawkins had a documentary that he did on uh the prisoner's dilemma mm-hmm. where he uh said about demonstrating that there's uh you know from kind of a game theory or evolutionary point of view that cooperation tends to be the winning strategy and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. But as far as this ties into authoritarianism or authority in general, uh, you know, I think it's logically necessary for there to be some sort of resistance to authority um, in any ideology that wants to push against authoritarian institutions. And so I want to have you give your take about, you know, how authority developed in, uh, I guess, in the context of the individual's life, but also uh, sociologically, so we could okay. start talking a little bit more. Okay, well, I think we're already talking about two types of authority, superego and conscience. Um, they are both authorities but one is authoritarian and the other is not Um, conscience is an authority a conscience has a bite if i am behaving in a way that is out of sync with my conscience i'm not sleeping well and i'm not feeling well Uh, My conscience is nagging at me. Um, But if my superego disapproves of me, it's trying to beat the shit out of me. It screams at me. It insults me. It tells me how stupid and inferior and ridiculous I am. The superego fundamentally is a sadist. It wants to inflict pain. It's a persecutor. Uh, It's at the center of all psychopathology. Mm -hmm. Depression is nothing more than an ongoing superego attack on myself. That's what depression is. Uh, Masochism is a submission to the domination and the whipping by the superego. So the superego is this sadistic agent. That is, it loves to catch me in wrongdoing, not because it gives a damn about right and wrong, just because if it catches me in wrongdoing, that legitimates it to do what it wants to do, which is to beat me up. That's very different than conscience. Conscience is also concerned with right and wrong, but it's a different set of rights and wrongs. It's not just the socially constructed norms. There are certainly universal norms that we come into the world already knowing, apparently. It's better to be kind than to be cruel. It's better uh, to be truthful than to be a liar. Um, There is a a universal, I think, built-in norm of reciprocity. Freud only saw half of it, Uh, an eye for an eye. That's superego morality. But there is another morality, love given for love received. That's conscience. So conscience is an authority. It does call me to account. But it's like a father who, when uh, he has to reproach his child, he's got tears in his eyes. 
He doesn't have a sadistic glint in his eyes. Now I get to beat the little bastard. You know, no. <laughs> He's sad that his kid has gone off the path. He wants his kid to come back on the path. And he's delighted when the kid does come back. I always think of the, 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 the story of the prodigal son. I mean, you know, he takes his inheritance and he blows it on whores and gambling in Babylon or wherever. And then he's broke and he comes crawling back and his father is delighted. Your brother is back. Slay the fatted calf. We're having a party. That's the way conscience feels. Conscience is, let me put it simply, conscience is grounded in love. Superego is grounded in hate. Two very different types of authority. I'm totally in favor of the authority of conscience. And I'm hmm. completely opposed to the authoritarianism of the superego. Uh, how that works out socially, I mean, uh, authoritarian authoritarianism in social and political life is the superego running amok. Um, but every human being has both a conscience and a superego. Some people wind up with a conscience that's dialed back so low you can hardly hear it. Um, yeah. <laughs> right. <clears throat> but, and sometimes the superego is dialed so loud you can't hear anything else. Um, but uh, but we all contain an inner authoritarian. There is no one who is not an authoritarian on some level because we all have a superego and superego is authoritarian. So um, I think we really, those of us who are concerned to oppose authoritarianism, we have to acknowledge that we ourselves are authoritarians. We need Absolutely. to know Yes, because otherwise we're just projecting it outward. And we're seeing it outside of ourselves and we're not seeing it in ourselves. In order to fight authoritarianism in society, we have to, first of all, fight the authoritarian within ourselves. So how does this cut against some of the ideas in psychoanalysis from like Otto Gross or Wilhelm Reich or some of these, uh, I guess, later thinkers in like Dillas and Guattari who would you know, really try to emphasize liberating desire, uh, I guess, uh, without any kind of constraint from the superego. Or the conscience, because they didn't even have the concept of conscience. I mean, we can't just go around liberating desire, um, not because our superego says so, but also because our conscience says you can't. Um, so clinically, there are many d dilemmas. You know, my patient is telling me that he's a lusty guy, always has been. And of course, he's cheating on wife number three, the way he cheated on wives number two and wife number one. And uh, analysts, uh, therapists are not supposed to be moralistic. So I'm not going tisk tisk. it's wrong to cheat. No, I'm sitting back and waiting till I see what are the consequences of his cheating. And then eventually I get around to say, Hey, have, have you ever noticed how every time you cheat on your wife, the migraines come back? Okay. That's how you work on it. Huh. Uh, um, there's that wonderful, at the beginning of my new book, there's a wonderful quote from uh, Seneca. Uh, okay. Escape as you may at the bar. Uh well, it ends with every guilty man is his own hangman. You might get away with it in the legal courts or whatever, but sooner or later, because every guilty man is his own hangman. Th that's why I'm writing about unconscious guilt. Many people suffer from all kinds of things, and they don't have any clue that this has anything whatever to do with guilt. It's unconscious guilt. Uh, my book is about guilt evasion. Human beings are guilt evaders. There's a million ways you can evade guilt. Uh, so you have headaches instead, uh, or you know you have insomnia, or you have a rash, or you have various aches and pains, or you get yourself involved with a woman who can't love but just totally <laughs> mm -hmm. 
ruins your day. Uh, you don't have to beat yourself up. You get someone else to do it for you. I don't mean just going to dominatrixes. That's an extreme form of this. But other people choose partners who are very unpleasant to be with. And that's a punishment. We get punishment. <clears throat> we don't know we're punishing ourselves. We don't know we have anything to punish ourselves for. This is unconscious. Psychoanalysis is about making what's unconscious conscious. So uh, what, how do you, so one of the things that this is going to apply to is, you know, ed, the way education works and the way our uh, school systems relate to children and uh, whether they take an authoritarian attitude or I guess a more uh, conscientious one, I guess would be the term. Yeah. What would be some of the uh, changes that would need to be made in, in education as a practice that would maybe support these kind of developmental uh, outcomes? Well, I haven't thought a lot about the implications of this for education, but um, I think it would be a shift from teaching rules and obedience to rules. That's, that's a good way to create a citizenry who will submit to Hitler. Rules right. and obedience, you know? God, that was what the school system was like when I was a kid. Sit up straight in your desk with your hands in front of you, feet in. Um, no, moral education um, should be taught through um, examples of lived experience, um, uh, little stories or little videos. Um, where someone is unfairly treated or someone is cheated or someone is bullied. And there should be discussion with the kids about their feelings. How do they feel about this? Of course, you're going to come across some pathological kids who, when they see a kid being bullied, they get excited sure. and, and thrilled. So those are sick kids. Um, we need to help them. Why are they getting excited? Because they're being beaten at home, usually. Um, but, but I guess that would be a move in a, in a somewhat psychotherapeutic direction. Uh, you can't go too far with the psychotherapeutic approach when you're in school. It's not like having a private therapist to work on it. But, but it could be pointing, pointing to the source of morality in one's feelings rather than in abstract rules. Okay. I think that uh, that's a pretty good answer for not having thought about it too much. <laughs> well, uh, you're stimulating me to want to write something about that now. So thank you for that. Well, so the thing I, I've been working on lately is uh, this uh, series of videos I want to do about identity crisis and um, developmental psychology and how, you know, Eric Erickson's thoughts would play into uh, an understanding of what's going on in America and probably a lot of other countries. And um, part of it is just about the way that media and marketing has really, uh, I think, centered a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a dictate to find a, some kind of identity that has a commercial purchase or political purchase. But another part of it is, you know, trying to get into these uh, issues in the system of education as well. Basically just wherever uh, development is being heavily impacted by various institutions. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is because you recently had a, uh, conversation that's on your channel about the crisis in psychoanalysis which touches on some of these culture war issues because it concerns the uh uh some sort of conflict i don't totally understand the details but between a group of students who were jewish and a teacher who was uh muslim and 
there is some sort of uh, accusation of anti-Semitism, but uh, how, I guess, what are the implications of understanding these uh, development is also including, well, I'm trying to think of how to put this. Um, You're asking about identity. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just start from there, I guess. Okay. Okay. Well, look, the first thing uh, that comes to mind um, is two different um, contexts in which identity develops. Um, and I think one is healthier and more natural, and, and another is artificial and really quite problematic. Um, I guess uh, I'm developing a bit of a critique of the media here, but by media, I'm not just including social media, Facebook or whatever, but, but advertising, um, it works with images. Uh, we're, uh, as we're very vulnerable to images. We're captured by images. Um, there, there's a, a type of, pathological, uh, a type of pathology, um, which is essentially a kind of a false self. Uh, the, the person is marketing himself. Eric Fromm referred to the marketing or in orientation as produced by consumer, you know, by late capitalism, the marketing orientation. I dress up, I present myself um, in a way that will um, be marketable and profitable. Um, some people, some kids, they dress up in an identity that they think is impressive for whatever reason. Um, now, this has always been a part of identity formation. Kids had their favorite, I'm a Canadian, their, their, their favorite hockey star and his, there'd be a big, poster of Borea Salming on the kid's wall. Um, so this is not new. I mean, identifying with images is a part of normal identity formation, but I want to contrast the process of merely glomming onto an image and trying to live up to it and trying to present it to the world. Um, I, I want to contrast that with uh, the kind of identity that develops between a boy and I'm, I'm going to go to dad rather than mom here. Um, I, I don't think I'm being sexist, but I'm, uh, it's something very important about the father-son relationship in the development of a boy's identity. And what's crucial is to have an available dad. Now, dads can't be always available. They sometimes have to take the train in the morning and come home late at night. And that's a problem. I mean, that's very different than the days when your dad was running the farm and you were seeing him, you were in the fields with him, for God's sake, you knew exactly what he did. You learned what he did from watching him do it. Uh, okay, that's long past, okay? But we still have some father-son relationships with the, where the father actually loves the son and he likes being with the son and he likes having his arms around his son's shoulders. And there's affection. And there's bonding. And they like doing things together. Well, that's a whole different sort of identity formation. You know, you're merging with this guy who's big and you're small and he knows how to do things and you don't. But he happily teaches you how and he's proud of you when you learn how to do it. And you've got this good thing going with dad. That's wonderful. That's the way it should be. That's where really healthy. Now that kid is less fascinated with images. He's less trying to force himself to live up to somebody's image. He's got his father's love. He's internalized his father's love. Um, and he kind of knows who he is. Um, <laughs> he's his father's son and he's his mother's son. Um, uh, people who are lacking in that as so many millions of people are because the family breaks down and and uh, all kinds of trouble and, and many kids don't get that wonderful thing that i just described um, 
what are they going to replace it with? Images on in, in, in Facebook or wherever, advertising images. They become image obsessed. They become false selves. They try to live their life through a kind of a false narrative that they've constructed and that they try to live up to. And they're really out of sync with any genuine inward feeling of identity. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of people want to blame the left for this sort of, uh, uh, you know, for identity politics, basically. And, um, you know, I don't know if we totally agree with each other, but I think it's not with, I think the first obvious place to look at why this is happening is, uh, is the media. And like you said, not just, uh, social media, but, uh, advertising, which has been messing around with, um, identity formation long before social media came out. I saw a documentary recently about corporations just unconscionably doing psychological research on, on little kids, tiny kids, sucking them into, you know, this materialist preoccupation with the latest toy. It's like. It's incredibly disgusting. Yes. And uh, this, the, this guy, Douglas Rushkoff has a, couple documentaries he did for pbs separated by maybe 10 years each and um they cover you know the old media system which was the five big conglomerates uh aol time warner you know uh clear channel this and that and the way that they used to uh have these uh marketing experts they would call cool hunters who would do one-on-one uh studies of children and teenagers and uh try to identify what they thought being cool was so that they could turn that around and uh manipulate that vulnerability that all of us have at in our adolescence and uh use it to profit he followed it up about Uh, 10 years later with another one called generation like where he turns towards the way social media functions and the way that every time we click on something that we like it, this feeds into an algorithm that basically is doing the same sort of thing. It's uh, providing data to these companies that are only interested in understanding us as consumers and uh, reinforcing this kind of identity formation that that you're talking about. Exactly. And yeah, this gap within that 10 year span, it's just an incredible amount of uh, complexity uh, in the way that characterology is done or yeah. uh, consumer profiling that I think is really screwed up uh, the well, way you know, identity One of Chomsky's early books was The Manufacture of Consent. Uh, what we've been talking about now is like the manufacture of addiction. That's a really good way to put it. So, mm-hmm. huh. So what can be done about that? How, how can, I think it's such a massively corrupting force that, yes. uh, and it happens so early in life that, uh, I'm not sure where the intervention can occur or how it could occur. Well, I mean, in the old days when we had a democratic government that would respond to social concerns, we would outlaw it. Just as we banned cigarettes to children, um, people should be disallowed. It should be forbidden to do this kind of advertising and this kind of research and manipulation of children. Yeah, I mean, the whole right wing right now is obsessed with this idea of the groomer, which Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of discourse happening in the United States. But, you know, trans identified people are being targeted as uh, 
you know, aggressive sexual perverts and uh, because that they groom people into a lifestyle of homosexuality. The, right. the most obvious case of grooming that's happening is in everybody's daily life. Through, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so this is a very different type of authority, I think, or is it? Uh, I'd like to uh, hear what you think about, I guess, types of authority, maybe, and how this uh, this would compare and contrast with some of the more traditional forms. Well, what are you what are you describing as an authority? These companies guess, who do this manipulative research. What do you mean? Maybe more so the results of their research, the images that they put out, and the way that it sets a normativity or an an ego ideal or something or something like that. Right, right. It, I, I'm having trouble thinking of that as an authority. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's sort of like pre-authority. I mean, the advantage of an authority. When I think of an authority, I think of someone telling me what to do and it's almost in telling me what to do they're kind of granting that i have the ability to to defy them to not do what they're telling me to do okay because they're out there announcing themselves as an authority carveth do this what we're describing here with the this manipulation of kids is pre-authority there's no authority telling me to do anything i don't even know i'm in the presence of an authority there is no authority all there are, all there is, is a bunch of toys and sparkly, shiny things um, that that I'm, you know, sort of implicitly being conditioned to want. Uh, this is harder to fight than authoritarianism is. You could say authoritarianism, in its normal forms, is almost giving the game away by coming on in an authoritarian way, an authoritarian can be opposed. Right. And this functions at the level of basic desire itself. And uh, Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's quite a dilemma. Yeah, I, I, I have never liked the work of Deleuze and Guattari at all. I mean, that, those people are kind of anathema to me, always have been. But they have this this word, I never quite understood what it was, but suddenly it seems quite relevant. They talk about desiring machines. And you could say that this manipulative uh, research is turning children into desiring machines. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they use some some of the worst uh, obscuring terminology you could. Absolutely, yeah. That's a whole other topic, the obscurantism in philosophy and social science, where does it begin? I mean, it doesn't begin with Foucault, uh, probably maybe with Hegel, probably, um, so that academics have to be obscure. Otherwise, if you're clear, you're dismissed as stupid. Oh, yeah, I would think Heidegger, too. With Heidegger, for sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, you want to talk about Heidegger a little? It just uh, I had one question actually. I thought of for you on that because you talk a lot about uh, Freud's death, death drive, and uh, Thanatos, and Heidegger has this other idea of being towards death. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I I've always related positively to that. Um, I just understood it. I mean, he associates kind of awakening to the fact that we are being towards death, uh, awakening to the fact that we are dying, that is the only way we can move into authentic life. Uh, waking up to the fact that we're dying. Um, uh, I think there's truth in that. Um, um, I mean, it can work the other way. You, you can be so frightened of, of death and dying that you can run and hide in, in a million pathological ways. But um, Heidegger has this idea of a marginal experience. A marginal experience can be a brush with, with death. The famous case um, 
be, being Blaise Pascal, um, what is that, 17th century? He's riding in a horse-drawn carriage by the Seine. There's this big embankment down into the Seine, and uh, the horse is bold, and the carriage almost turns over, and the carriage door swings open, and he's almost thrown out of the carriage to certain death. But he manages to hang on and pull himself back in, and the carriage writes. And um, he writes something. I forget what the words were that he wrote. And then he sewed that into the breast pocket of his jacket. Um, and he thinks that that, is, that for him was an awakening moment. Um, uh, I, think, uh, I think there's truth to this. Because I think we wander through life. Um, a lot of people are wandering through life in what Ernest Becker called a denial of death. Um, so yeah, death, sometimes we get waked up. Um, so I think Heidegger's onto something with that. And that's different from the Freudian death drive, uh, in what way? Well, I, I mean, Heidegger is talking about a, an awakening, an awareness. He's not talking about a drive. I mean, the worst parts of Freudian theory and of those people who followed this aspect of, which is drive, drive theory. So I rejected it even before I trained as an analyst. It's amazing that I got through analytic training <laughs> already rejecting drive theory. Uh, we, we, because that's exactly against Sartre and Fromm. Oh, yeah. For Sartre and Fromm, we are the beings who woke up, and we are the animals who, who don't have drives. Other animals are programmed by their drives. We don't have any drives to program us. Uh, and here's Freudian theory, completely out of sync with that understanding. As if we come into the world with this id composed of sexual and aggressive drives. Now, people like Wilhelm Reich, and others really go with that. That's a mistake. That's 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 they have the wrong philosophical anthropology. Our problems come not from drives, they come from freedom that we can't bear and that we seek to escape one way or another. And with freedom, of course, comes guilt. That's why I write about guilt so much. Someone asked me recently, "Why? why, why are, are you a very guilty man? Are you? <laughs> you seem you seem guilt obsessed, you know." And and um, the answer is no. Of course, I I'm, I'm a guilty man. I I struggle with guilt because to me, that's what human life is about. See, I I I I got exposed to Christianity very early on, Episcopal Church. I lost it all. It became a great angry atheist for many decades and then it kind of came back but in a completely secular way i don't like supernatural i hate woo woo magical thinking but the themes of the new testament and and the old testament for me are ex they, these are narratives that contain existential truth they need to be demythologized you understand it as metaphor but um Human beings are always guilty on some level. They have to be because we're always transgressing in minor or major ways, if not in our actions, at least in our thoughts, in our dreams. Um, so we're struggling with guilt. So uh, guilt is a, is a dimension of human existence. It's part of what it is to be human. That's why I write about it. It's not just an emotion. Um, it's a dimension of human existence, guilt. What is, what type of uh, psychoanalytic school, I guess, do you consider yourself? Because well, uh, you I, mentioned that. I, I mentioned? Uh, the drive that you're opposed to sort of the drive uh, theory, right. metapsychology. And right. Well, you know, in, in, in many ways, I think Eric Fromm would, would, would still call himself a Freudian, minus the drive theory. He accepted much of Freud. You know, he wrote a book called The Greatness and Limitations of Freud's Thought. He acknowledged the greatness of Freud's thought. Like Fromm, I consider myself a Freudian, minus those chunks that I think 
uh, need to be placed in the trash. Uh, but there's much there that is crucially valuable. And I follow the development of Freud's thought by Melanie Klein. So I would call myself a Kleinian Freudian, a Freudian who has been influenced to a considerable extent by Melanie Klein. But then all of the other great thinkers are, are in my, my, my knapsack too. Donald Winnicott, uh, Heinz Kohut, um, uh, Eric Fromm, of course. Um, so it's basically a Freudian Kleinian plus. And I'm not Klein, eclectic. Go ahead. Is Klein object relations, is that where that comes from? Yeah, she's considered, well, Freud is the first object relations thinker because he moved into the area of internalization of, 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 of objects, but Klein really runs with that. Yeah, she's the most, the, the first pure object relations theorist. Um, but like Freud, you see, Freud, in the early days, Freudians and Kleinians had royal battles with one another about various issues. Freud believed in primary narcissism at the beginning. Klein rejected that from day one. She says infants are related to an object from, the, from day one. There's no symbiotic oneness stage. Uh, so they had battles about these things. But nowadays, they have so much in common with one another in comparison to the relational psychoanalyst, the self-psychologist, the relational, the intersubjectivity theorists, the trauma theorists, um, that Freudians and Kleinians get along very well. Most today, most Freudians, many Freudians today have integrated a good deal of Melanie Klein into their thinking. So what is the problem today or the the conflict today in psychoanalysis i know you one of your books is uh focused on that right well i, I there I, I think fundamentally you know what it is it's 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 ironic uh i i i tried to write a phd in sociology comparing sociological and psychoanalytic theories of human nature and I had great difficulty getting a committee to let me do this because in the 60s and 70s, psychoanalysis and sociology just did not mix, you know, like oil and water. They just didn't mix. But there was this one sociologist in New York City, an expat Canadian, as it turned out, by the name of Dennis Rom, who wrote in 1961 this classic article called The Over-Socialized Concept of Man in Modern Sociology. And this was music to my ears. He was a Freudian sociologist, you know. I built my PhD around him. But my work in those days was, it was the conflict, really, between um, a psychoanalytic view, not drive theory. That's where I differed from Dennis. He went with Freud and drive theory to oppose complete sociologism. I oppose complete sociological relativism, but I was not happy with drive theory. So I had to find a third way. It took me a number of years to find it. Um, but the problem then really became, you have the overly biological Freudians with their drives, and you have the overly sociological constructionist people. And it's the same fight today, um, only it's not about drives. It's about the idea of an autonomous psyche. Is there a psyche? Uh, is there a human nature? I mean, everyone thought that Marx denied human nature. It's baloney. For, uh, Marx understood there is such a thing as universal human nature, but it expresses itself very differently under different social and historical circumstances. But there is a universal human nature. Eric Fromm pounces on that. So there is a human nature, and there is a psyche, a human psyche that has some autonomy. It is not just a social product. Um, the way I put it in that recent talk is, I mean, the relational intersubjective critical social justice theory, it's just the old sociology. I started with that and now it's coming back in spades and invading psychoanalysis. Um, it's a denial of the autonomy of the psyche. So. A bunch of feminists in the 60s, they're doing consciousness raising, trying to get right. free of patriarchal ideology, right? 
But then a bunch of them began to recognize that even after all the consciousness raising, they could still only get hot for sexist men, and they still had all kinds of erotically tinged rape fantasies. So some of them decided, oh, okay, patriarchy, patriarchy goes deeper than consciousness. We're going to have to do some unconsciousness raising, which is a perfect definition of what psychoanalysis is. So those feminists <laughs> turn to psychoanalysis, okay? And it will be the same with the CSJT types today. They think that you can have a, an emancipation, a liberation by identifying your positionality and your intersectionality vis-a-vis -vis race, gender, class. And that's all good to know. I mean, we should all have that consciousness of our positionality, but that, that's not going to get rid of my obsession or my perversion. I got to go to a psychoanalyst if I'm going to get rid of my depression, my perversion, my, my compulsion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So there's all sorts of stuff that uh, what you just said makes me want to respond with. But, you know, one thing that comes up for me over and over when I'm watching your videos is just, uh, you know, you're from your generation that you're from, I think is probably the same as my parents. And so the literature that you talk about is the stuff I'm familiar with. Uh, and it seems like there is some sort of return to that period in a, a number of different ways. Uh, one you mentioned with the way that uh, critical social justice, whatever that's that acronym is that you used. Um, Theory. Yeah. CSJT. But there, there was this like break with all of that, I guess in the nineties or something where whenever I bring this stuff up to people that are more my age, they're not familiar with from or, Erickson or Maslow or like any of these people who they're all like reading Lacan or uh yeah or uh Adorno or yeah you know some other critical theory and I'm I've been really trying to understand what the hell happened uh between well, yeah absolutely you're right but I'm gonna go out on a limb and I'm gonna say that the reason people are reading, look, there are some good things in Lacan. I, in, in my 2018 book, I did a chapter called uh, Lacan Appreciation and Critique. And uh, some of my friends said, Don, drop the appreciation. It's all bullshit. No, it's not all bullshit. There is stuff in there um, uh, that I deeply appreciate in Lacan. But he was an obscurantist. I mean... And he was a deep narcissist, pathological narcissist. No one writes like that. See, if a person wants to connect with another human being, they strive to be clear because you want to connect. A lot well, of these guys are divas. Yeah. Yeah. De they're Dear the, divas on. And they're sadistic. Um, it was the French analyst um, Grunberger who he, he didn't name Lacan, but he clearly was thinking about Lacan. And, and he was saying that this is an anal snare. You put, you put people, you hoodwink people. You put them in a hood. You, 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 um, it's, it's a form of anal sadism. You don't communicate clearly. You set out to baffle people, befuddle people. And of course, then they get impressed. This is, this is the technique of, uh, of certain con artists and, and certain gurus. Um, right, negging. Yeah, yeah, and 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 young people are drawn to this because they think that if they can start to speak and pretend to understand that they're somehow being initiated into a special kind of wisdom, and they are so superior to characters like Carveth who try to put together clear sentences. So it's what psychopathology. You... It's a form of psychopathology. Is what it is. Yeah, it's. I think it's. I almost feel like there's all this progress being made uh, in social psychology, and uh, I, I guess pre seventies or pre nineteen seventy or I don't know exactly how to date it, but mm -hmm. uh, I 
you know, for as much as sort of the radical femin- feminism or sort of, you know, the second wave kind of stuff is returning. Uh, I feel like you're probably one of the few that seems to be bringing people around to the good stuff that was being produced in that period as well. Right. And uh, you mentioned in something about seeing a return to from in one of your yeah. videos. And I'm curious about, I don't, I haven't noticed that, What I'm wondering what you were saying. Well, there is a group uh, and they, uh, there are several from organizations now and some young scholars, uh, uh, an Irish scholar by the name of Kieran Durkin, um, wrote about the radical humanism of Eric Fromm. He's written a couple of other books and many articles since. Um, Daniel Burston, uh, I was on his PhD committee uh, 30 years ago when he did a, a dissertation on Fromm that later became his, his book on Fromm, and he's still uh, working on Fromm and is part of the revival. My colleague Neil McLaughlin uh, at uh, McMaster University here has been working on From for decades and is part of this From revival. Um, so it is going on in uh, the universities. Um, it's a it's it's a small thing. It, it hasn't blossomed yet, but there are real efforts to reveal From as the profound scholar that he was to try to undo the damage done by Adorno. Now there's an uh-huh. obscurantist. There's an obscurantist that a lot of people fall for. Um, but you know, he uh, Adorno and Horkheimer really uh, trashed Eric Fromm. Tried to represent him as a simplistic popularizer. Um, sometimes Fromm, well, he suffered from writing too clearly, <laughs> the sin of writing clearly, uh, because he wanted to be understood. He wanted to communicate. Um, but it was a total hatchet job that Adorno and Horkheimer did on Fromm. And people are trying to, to push that aside now and get Fromm out from under that. Yeah, I you're the only uh I haven't read about any of that myself. I ordered the book that you the biography of Fromm that you recommended in one of your videos. Uh, right. But uh I didn't realize that he had been attacked like that. I know. I'm more familiar with the way Sartre was attacked. Um, Right. Well, they tried to push him out of the history of the Frankfurt School. He was central to the Frankfurt School at the beginning. He was right there at the beginning and central to it. And then they pushed him out and tried to write him out of its history. And how about Marcuse? Did he? uh... Well, he was part of that. He was part of that. uh, There was a famous dialogue between Fromm and Marcuse in uh, the magazine Descent. They went back and forth uh, in two issues. And, um, you know, Marcuse dressed himself up as the loyal Freudian embracing Freud's drive theory, which is the worst part of Freud to embrace, and uh, attacking Fromm for being critical of the worst part of Freudian theory, uh, accusing Fromm of... um, being a member of the culturistic school, succumbing to sociological reductionism, losing the psyche and the social, which Fromm never did. Uh, Hardly anyone except me, if I may say so, has noticed that Fromm is not guilty of either biological or sociological reductionism. He saw the danger of both, and he embraced a third paradigm, existentialism. Uh, right. I don't think he, he didn't call himself an existentialist. He just wrote about freedom and, and, and what a burden it is. Well, and the parallels are between Fromm and existentialism are just so clear. You have anatomy of human destruction, destructiveness, which is, you know, it could very well compare with stuff that Camus was writing. Yes. Or, uh, you know, to have or to be. I know we talked about that a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, uh, you know, I think he has some writing just about being. Yes, uh, he does. And, uh, yeah, it's it's really uh, dumbfounding how people could have missed that. I mean, Fromm was, I know you know this, but I don't think people watching this know this, that uh, he was 
a mega popular writer. Everyone was reading The Art of Loving. Uh, the only reason I know about him is because I spent a lot of my youth at a used bookstore and his books were always turning up. Sure. Uh, People don't so, know what he did with the money. He made millions from those books. And they don't know what he did with it. He uh, he funded... Um, he was one of the two primary funders of, oh, I'm blocking on the name of the organization. Amnesty International. Amnesty yeah. International. They don't know that. I didn't know that either till I heard you say that. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah it's incredible. He also wrote a speech for JFK. Um, JFK may have altered a few words here and there, but basically the speech was written by Eric Fromm. He was also very close to, uh, what's his name, the famous senator of uh, um, one of the major Senate committees. He was close friends with that man. Again, I'm blocking on his name. He really tried to have a practical inf uh, uh, inf uh, influence on, on, on American politics. Yeah, it's, it's I hope he uh, returns Fulbright. to uh, pop. Fulbright. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hope he returns to more people's awareness. Um, I guess, you know, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We're at about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, for me, Sartre is probably my biggest influence right now. His uh, take on That's human rare. nature. You're, you're a rare bird, man. I mean, not many people that nowadays are very influenced by Sartre. That's also true as well. I guess I understand why a bit more so. It doesn't surprise me quite as much. But uh, you mentioned, I don't know if we were recording or not, but you mentioned um, his uh, uh, sex life and some of his, you know, he's kind of a, an annoying guy in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But a brilliant, annoying guy. I mean, brilliant people are often annoying, and and and, and, and like they're like all of us. Um, there are different sectors of the human psyche. I mean, a person can be brilliant and good in one sector, and can be really dumb and really bad in another sector. He can't take people as a whole thing because we're not. We're we're divided selves. To, to quote the title of one of R.D. Lang's books, The Divided Self, that I think is Freud's basic discovery. You know, when he comes into the harbor with uh, Jung and Ferenzi in 1909, they're, they're passing on <laughs> the Statue of Liberty and, and they're leaning against the rail and Freud says they don't realize we're bringing them the plague. And what did he mean by the plague? There is no unitary self. We are contradictory beings and always will be. The analysts didn't get it entirely, and Freud himself didn't accept it entirely. He remained ashamed of his interest in numerology and Kabbalah, that woo-woo stuff. He projected that onto Jung and then kicked Jung out. He wanted to be a, a, a thorough enlightenment rationalist, and he, he denied his own discovery that we're always double. Sick people are double. All of us are double. We have an unconscious. There's no one self. Okay, so Sartre had a nasty side, that's for sure. But he had a brilliant side. Um, and some of his insights are just remarkably brilliant. Um, the whole idea that human beings are engaged in a battle to the death uh, with each other. I'm trying to make you an object and render myself a pure grand uh, subject Meanwhile, you're trying to reverse it and make me an object to establish yourself as subject. And this plays out between men and women. The man tries to make himself master by dominating the woman. Um, but meanwhile, she makes herself so attractive, an object to him, that he becomes addicted to her and now she's mastering him. Uh, <laughs> you know, Sartre had great insight into all of this. Uh, no, of course, he left out the possibilities of love, although there are two footnotes in Being and Nothingness, tiny footnotes where he says, of course, I'm describing life in the condition of bad faith. He says, I'm right. going to write a, yeah, he says, I'm going to write a book about life in good faith, but he never writes it. 
Um, and then in another footnote, he talks about the, the possibility of a radical conversion. Yes. Um, all, all of this sadomasochism is going on unless I can convert from trying to be what I'm not, God, uh, to being what I am, uh, namely a divided, contradictory self. If, if, if I can accept and desire, convert to desiring what I am, then that opens up a possibility of a whole different basis of social relating. That's very psychoanalytic. In many oh ways. yeah, he uh, the scholarship on Sartre is really hit or hit or miss. I mean, I think you're probably like one of ten people who like are familiar with critique of dialectical reason that speak English. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, in the secondary literature, the points you just made about conversion and um, uh, that being in nothingness is uh, an analysis of bad faith and right. uh usually isn't uh noticed by sartre scholars and the place that you have to turn to really uh get his expanded ideas on that is his notebooks for an ethics which i don't know if they were ever uh i don't know I don't when they were they, i don't think in. they were available in my day i don't think i've studied those yeah and we know that mm -hmm. uh the second volume of critique of dialectical reason wasn't available until the 90s Right. So the scholarship has just been, uh, I don't want to say worthless, but it's been very, very limited. Right. Yeah. In English. Um, so, so how do you, how do you square his views on human nature with, uh, I guess some, some of what we've been talking about with Fromm and Freud and Marx and a more oh. universal view. Well, I, I, I just, um, I guess I do this with all scholars. Um, I'm interested, okay, when I'm studying a new complex theorist, uh, I, I, I allow myself to be raped. Uh, I simply lie back and enjoy it. I let myself be raped by Heidegger or by Freud or by Sartre. I turn off the critical apparatus and I just breathe it in, okay? And then after about a year of that, I turn on the critical apparatus. But the trouble with so many graduate students is they've got the critical apparatus going from day one. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You can't, they can't learn. They're too busy critiquing to learn, you know? So I just swallow it. And then I dig myself out um, and I separate the wheat from the chaff. And uh, people call me a Freud basher. I'm nothing. I, that's not me at all. I'm a great Freud admirer, but he made some colossal errors and you need to separate the wheat from the chaff. The same thing with Sartre, all that brilliant stuff we've just been talking about, but he doesn't tell us anything about love. Um, and he was very ethically messed up. Um, <laughs> there's a story in the Hazel Rowley biography uh, he had a, a secretary who sat at a desk just outside Sartre's office, and he would overhear Sartre on the phone, on the phone talking, talking to Mistress Number One, and then when that call was over, he'd be talking to Mistress Number Two, and he's telling all of these lies. And the secretary says, oh, it, "It must be hard sometimes dealing with it." And Sartre says, "Oh yes, yes, it's very hard. Um, you, you you need uh, uh, an ethics." somewhat like an umbrella uh, that you put up when you need it because it's raining and, and when you don't need it, you put that ethics away. So he's, oh. he's explicitly talking about a, a conscious embrace of complete hypocrisy. <laughs> okay, uh, so look, I mean, this is a very flawed human being, um, but a brilliant human being. Um, you have to separate the wheat from the chaff, and you gather the chaff. That's how you live the intellectual life. You've got this pouch with the with with the wheat, and you're just adding to it all the time, right? Yeah, that's. I I think my approach is pretty similar. I really invest myself in uh, an author completely for a while, and then I try to reflect on it later when I think I got it. Right. right. Well, I. This is, I'm really happy to have had you on to talk about all this stuff. I, there's so much more. I'd love to have you back. 
uh, if you wanted to spend more time on something else you're working on or whatever the case may be. Sure. Let's do uh, that at some point. Awesome. Uh, yeah. If there's anything I left out that uh, you want to tell the audience about, this would be a good time. I think we've covered a lot. I, uh, nothing jumps out as, uh, as being missing other than maybe just to say another word about the value of clinical psychoanalysis, um, not just to get rid of overt pathological symptoms, but I mean, to help you become creative, to help you get past some of the blocks to your creativity. I mean, I owe my creativity uh, to psychoanalysis and, and to my wife. Um, but I wouldn't have had my wife if I hadn't first had psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, but, you know, look, there are many ways that our creativity is hampered by us. You know, we, we put down these, we put down blocks in our path and we sabotage and we limit ourselves. And psychoanalysis can be of great help in uh, liberating us to become as creative as we, we can be. So on that note, I think we've covered just about everything. <laughs> well, maybe we could pick up there next time we talk, because there's uh, that's actually something else that I'm really interested in as well. The uh, aesthetics and psychoanalysis and uh, uh, all, that whole field. So okay. that would be good. good. It's been fun right. talking to you, Jared. I've enjoyed it. You too. I really appreciate it. Okay. All right, going to end the recording.